Spirit Work Bird Farm. I'm Lindy, I'm the owner. This is Todd, our farm manager, and Megan, our apothecary manager. Hello. And um, I'm just going to briefly share a little bit about the farm. Um, the property was bought in 2011, and we started the farm, the medicinal herb farm aspect of it, um, with the inspiration of my son, who is a clinical herbalist and a naturopathic physician in the Seattle area, who uh, was talking about the expanding and growing need for um, high quality medicinal herbs. And this is a market that will probably be uh, tripling in the next 10 years. Um, What's the name of your farm again? Spirit Works Herb. Spirit Works Herb Farm. Uh, I'll uh, give you each a business card after I finish the introduction. Um, basically, um, the intent and, that we've had is to grow high quality medicinal herbs um, in a handcrafted um, artisan way. So it's, we're not a huge production. We're not growing acres of one herb. We're growing our herbs in a um, in a companion planting, um, more landscape natural naturalized um, manner. And in that, we we've, we've had a lot of fun with design elements, and that's a big part of what we're going to share today. And um, leave the rest for questions for later if you want to know more about the farm. But what we really want is for you to leave here feeling that you are totally empowered and passionate about um, growing at least half a dozen to a dozen herbs for your own home use and having a, a, uh, a way to do that that's visually, aesthetically, and spiritually um, energizing for you. So, uh, as Libby said, today we're going to be talking about garden design, specifically how to grow your own herbs. And so, uh, within this presentation, we're going to talk about purpose and intent, which is very important in all aspects of gardening, but especially if you're planning on growing medicinal herbs. We're going to talk about uh, different design elements to get your brain juices flowing. We're going to talk about how to select the herbs and for what uses you're going to be uh, wanting your garden. and also how to harvest and process these herbs. And during this presentation, I, I handed out, we all handed out some paper and pens. I highly recommend you write down goals, you write down design elements, and under design elements, write down uh, herb selection and design selection. So as we start talking about these things, we're gonna blast you guys with information. Okay, so we're gonna go pretty quickly. So if anything is interesting, um, highly recommend writing it down so that you can investigate it later. And at the end of this presentation, we've included a whole list of resources um, that you can find on our website as well. And I'll mention that again later. But um, yeah, so throughout this presentation, just start thinking about your dream garden, your dream herb garden. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Todd to start talking about different design elements. Hi, I'm Todd. Um, but with garden design, I'm not sure if you guys have garden uh, at home or if you're what kind of space you're working with, but it's important to, uh, can, like Megan said, consider your goals and purpose. There's all sorts of reasons you want to have herbs in your garden, whether it's culinary uses. Um, some of you maybe have saw like the kettle care uh, stand down uh, in our in the work uh, booths area. Uh, if you're doing home cosmetics, uh, making your own kinds of house cleaners, things like that, those are all good reasons to have your own herbs. Because uh, they're essential. That's that's really essential oil. That's where they're coming from. Uh, so identifying your goals and your purposes for your garden is going to be the first way to do it. If you're making teas like we like to do a lot, um, there are some ways you can incorporate that. Uh, your size, space, and light are important. Uh, pretty, pretty straightforward with most gardens, um, most farming. Uh, not a lot of people have you know, the full backyard. Sometimes you're stuck in an apartment and you only have that south-facing window in your kitchen. Um, there are ways you can still grow herbs. Many people are probably familiar with the pot growing uh, herbs that you can get at the Home Depot stores, things like that. Um, but yeah, considering what you have available to you in terms of materials as well, um, DIY and upcycling is a huge thing. Uh, you don't want to have to go out and spend a whole bunch of money to build a raised bed. If you have materials you can use right there at home that are just sitting around um, taking up space. So being able to use things like uh, old rock, 
busted up brick from a, a previous project, if you have old boards that, or pallets sitting around, because free pallets are so accessible, uh, you can get them in from anywhere if you just ask around. Um, but uh, when building these, you want to be able to make sure your garden is accessible. Uh, you don't want to put it way off in the back of your property and then forget that it's there because it's behind the shed. You never see it all the time. It's like, if that's the most optimal light, maybe. But um, you, there are other ways you, uh, you want to be able to uh, incorporate that into your everyday life. So right there at the windowsill, doorstep potted plants. Uh, they're great things. A lot of herbs love to grow in pots too, so it's not a bad way to go. Um, and just keeping it fresh and in your life. Uh, you want to be able to clip that fresh basil for that meal. You don't have to, have to walk, you know, 17 uh, meters or yards out in the backyard to be able to get it. So, um, we have wildness on our slide. Now, wildness is uh, it's a fun one because you want to be able to have it feel like it's it's natural. You want it to feel like it's a, a good place to to go and be connected to the plants. And that, where else are you going to find these plants other than in the wild? So, uh, we'll talk about agroforestry later on in this a little bit. I'm not sure if you guys have known anything about that, but incorporates elements of farming in the wild and, in, and bringing that uh, forest kind of closer into your home and feeling the connection with nature. So being able to have that connection with your herbs as well is vital and important. Uh, and scapes are, are, my background is landscaping uh, and setting up things to block bad views or create a, a peaceful, quiet place for yourself is huge. And there are a lot of herbs that can do that. Um, M. Grieve, she's one of my favorite herbal authors. Uh, she writes about elderberry bush. She says if you're going to plant, uh, start a home, plant elder first. Uh, it makes this beautiful lush hedge, hedgerow, um, and it's things like that that can really give you that privacy and kind of stop the view of you know uh, really ugly things that you might not want to be looking at. If there's a big, big shed or something, you're like, oh, I can't <coughs> plant something on there. There's plenty of light. But uh, consider those in, in terms of uh, what you can do with your herbs. There are all sorts of herbs that have varying heights and sizes. Um, echinacea is a, a great herb that has different heights as well, so you, um, that'll help change your boundary landscape uh, just in the two types of echinacea that are common for the herbs that we're recommending. Um, and maintenance is a huge thing. You don't want to have to spend a whole bunch of time maintaining your garden, and not everyone, most everyone has a 40 hour work week, uh, and they're not full time farmers or gardeners, so it's, be, it's important to be able to have low maintenance. If you can water the one on your windowsill every day, Cool. That's that's an easy one. That's there's not many weeds you're going to get out of that sterile soil. Uh, but being able to have adequate coverage and using herb spacing uh, to cover most of your soil without having any exposed ground is going to really minimize the weeding you have to do and uh, and really take it to the next level. Uh, so this is the fun part. This is where the graph paper comes in. Uh, we start talking about garden design and think about the spaces you guys have at your own place. Uh, you have uh, an area that's already cooking in your brain, like that little nook between the garage and where the house meets up. Um, those are fun spaces to consider. Uh, here we have a, a picture of a literal medicine wheel. Those are herbs growing in that, in that wheel. Um, and it, it's fun to how you can be creative with uh, different types of design. If you want to have teas for um, sleeping, if you want to have things like uh, skull cap or lavender, things that are really going to knock you out at night. Uh, Go ahead and put them in a, a literal raised bed with an old uh, old bed frame that somebody might be pitching out. Uh, it's, it's fun to be, but that comes back to the easy to access materials and things you might just have lying around. Um, but uh, it's fun to be creative like that. It really makes it whimsical, it really makes it your own, and uh, you, can, you can kind of just create what you have uh, with the space available too. And incorporating your intention uh, with that is super, uh, is really gonna make it all that much more uh, what you're going for. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, pots, pots, pots. I love this slide. Um, I used to hate potting. Uh, I actually I kind of have fallen back in love with it. There's uh, a lot you could do with it. A lot of plants you could start them that way in your greenhouse so that you can winter them over really easily, which is huge. Things like rosemary don't last in in Montana, Northwest Montana. They just don't winter over. Uh, they're too too low, too high of a zone for us. Um, but uh, what's great about these is you can put them anywhere. They're beautiful. If you have a garden already established and you want to just create an accent piece, you can have a potted plant that way. There are ones you can buy that are massive. It actually beautiful eye, um, features to your garden as well. But uh, if you're trying to contain an herb, that's not a bad way to go too. Mint loves to spread. So if you're putting it in your garden, it'll, it'll want to go everywhere. Uh, and it, it propagates by root quite easily and it goes deep. 
Um, so one way you can do that is cutting off the bottom of an uh, old plastic uh, pot, putting it deep in the soil so it's actually incorporated into your garden, but then it self-contains. And as it gets older, you can take it out, unbind the uh, roots, and continue to grow it successfully, propagate more, make even more mint, uh, give it to your neighbors, gifts, things like that. It's not a bad way to how go. Deep, how deep does your pot need to be for mint? Um, I would say at least a, a six inch pot. Okay. And as it gets older, it has it gets more root bound. Um, you can get a bigger gallon size one, it'll, it should be fine. Okay. Whatever you put it in, it'll grow to it. So. <laughs> yeah, mint is crazy. Yeah. yeah. Um, more in garden design. Uh, spiral gardens are something that we're trying to incorporate on our farm uh, with, our, with a new design we're doing in our high tunnel. We just finished up a grant program and we're really revamping it and it's, I'm really excited to see what we're doing with it and to show you guys as well. So please, please feel free to come to the garden uh, and see what we have. Uh, spiral gardens are great because they incorporate your vertical space. You're going to be able to take advantage of light if you have a small backyard or you don't have a whole lot of room. Uh, the materials are pretty easily accessible. For small ones like this, you can usually get some of these old scrap things they bought for a landscape project and like, oh, I have this extra. It, it's usually just the right amount. Um, not only that, it helps you control the uh, watering. Um, if you have plants that have a lot of water needs, you can put them in a lower part in the sloping hill. Uh, That's this the great thing about the spiral is it will naturally give you the water where you need it. Um, they're aesthetically pleasing. They're beautiful. I have a tattoo of the Fibonacci spiral. I think it's a, a um, one of the most incredible uh, design aspects out there, and it's just a natural feature. Uh, it's aesthetically pleasing, and it's been proven to be something that's easy to do. Uh, so if you want to look up the mathematics on how to do that, it's it's pretty fun, um, and it uh, really it draws you in. It has that natural feel, and it has that sense of wildness to it. So creating something that looks like it was meant to be there, it kind of developed on its own. is going to be essential for making your garden beautiful. Um, they can be compact, or they can be quite large. We do have you saw on a, a original slide earlier, our mandala that has spirals in included. Um, and that's something I'll talk about more in a little bit, but uh, um, yeah, go ahead. Um, but labyrinth gardens are something that's equally beautiful. Um, they really just draw you right in. This one is a lavender, lavender labyrinth in, uh, in Michigan. And these are for the, the true gardener, like I'm out there all the time, this is what I want to do, I don't want to go inside at all. Uh, uh, come on in. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, uh, you can. Um, uh, you, if you have the time and you have the ability to, to create a, a true labyrinth of your own, go for it. There are plenty of herbs that you can put in there. On our farm alone, we grow over 150 different types of herb alone. Um, that's not including our vegetables and and other uh, and, well, I guess chickens that aren't really herbs. But, um, but there are plenty of things you could put in there. Uh, and, and feel free to look them up. They're a little harder to design. Uh, getting all the points just right so it's not looking a little cattywampus is, is important, but um, if you have the time and you have the skills to do it, please do. Uh, mandala gardens are fun because you don't have to be so uh, strategic with your placement. Ours is actually the shape of a Triskelion. It's a fun thing. It's a, a way to draw energy um, spiritually into the garden and have it manifest those intentions with what we're trying to grow here. Um, ours rep represents in the three spirals, uh, learning, farming, and growing health. Uh, and we kind of incorporate that with our team as well as our apothecary manager. Uh, Lindy's kind of creating a, a whole holding healing space. And I'm a farm manager as well, so we've got a, a Triskelion team as well. Um, but no, there are endless possibilities of what you can create. Uh, you, there are some farms around. I can't remember who has the yin and the yang. I believe that's help me out. Uh, is it no, purple, purple? Someone, someone in the valley or in, in the northwest Montana has a yin and yang garden somewhere. I can't remember who I saw that from. Anyway, uh, but it's a great way to hold your attention. I've seen raised beds that are small for like dream tea beds. Again, to go back to that, they're shaped like a crescent moon, um, and that's their mandala. That's their intention of putting into it. And it, the, the flowers I've seen come out of it, they have some pretty incredible, uh, incredible herbs. Um, but yeah, whatever you can create. So. You've got that graph paper there. If your mind's brewing, if you're getting some ideas of what you're wanting to grow and why, go for it. Uh, keyhole gardens are great for people who really want to be able to have perfect access to their gardens. Um, it's designed with the intention of um, being able to get into the middle of your garden. If you have a raised bed that's so large, reaching over four feet in is not, not feasible. 
Not for most of us, at least, unless you have six feet on. Um, but what this does is it really it cuts in and it allows you to get to the inside and work uh, work from within. And one great way that uh, has been introduced to this concept has been incorporating your compost directly into it. And what that does is it provides vital nutrients directly into your soil, it helps with water retention, you're getting worm castings and things like that. Um, and this is anything that you want to grow in here. This isn't just herbs, this is just a garden design element. Um, you can, it's really gonna boost the, the nutrient level of anything that you need to grow. Some things take a lot of nitrogen, um, your brassius is just gonna soak up everything. So go ahead and put those in there too, they grow really well as companion plants. But I've seen this before. I was wondering, does the does it shrink down as it composts? It does. Okay. Yeah. So you can just keep loading up. A lot of times you'll just take a, a tube of chicken wire. You can fasten together with some ties, and then as the compost settles, just keep adding it on top of it. And what's on the bottom is just going to be the richest dirt. And then your plants are going to go for it. They're going to yeah. they're going to send those roots down, and they're going to extract it no problem. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, See? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna pass this over to Megan. She knows a little bit more about agroforestry than I do. Uh, but yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you, Todd. And I'm not gonna talk too much about this because there's a lot of resources out there. If you guys are really interested in this topic, I just wanted to introduce it to you, especially since we're here in Northwest Montana with lots of forests. Um, and there's a few things that I want you guys to know. There's one, a ton of medicinal herbs that grow in the forests here. And if you are going to harvest them, please, please, please harvest them sustainably, which means only no more than 20% of the plant at any given time. Um, and yeah, lastly, like I said, just start thinking about the possibilities of um, growing some food potentially in a forest and on that boundary line between your properties. So Todd covered a lot of different design elements um, that you can grow your herbs in, but now, what are you gonna grow? So there's hundreds of thousands of herbs out there, all with a bunch of different varieties. And so what I'm going to do is cover a few different categories of herbs and their uses. Um, so I separated it into herbs for household uses, cosmetics, first aid, and uh, culinary and wellness. Um, and as I had mentioned, there's a bunch of different plant varieties out there. But the ones we grow at SpiritWorks Herb Farms are the ones that have the most medicinal properties. So if you have any questions about which herbs to grow, um, please feel free to contact us anytime. Um, also, going back to purpose and intent um, as we started this lecture off with, keep in mind what, what you want to grow there. If it's uh, perhaps a herb garden for uh, culinary uses that you want to be able to grab fresh basil to make your pesto every day. Um, so start thinking about how you're going to do that and, and what herbs you want to grow for those purposes. Um, so uh, just quickly, household uses. There's a lot of really fun stuff you can do. So lavender, for example, you can incorporate that into your cleaning products to give it that lovely smell, um, which is it's an aromatic as well, so it'll help you calm down while you're cleaning up all that nastiness. Um, and so how I separated these was is Here's the different products that you can create with your herbs. And here's some suggestions of herbs to start with. And like I said, this is not a comprehensive list. So there's plenty, plenty more out there. Um, and in the references at the end, there's, that's where you guys can look for, for some more ideas. But um, lemon balm is also one of my favorites, um, as well as basil. Drinking it earlier. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so herbs for cosmetic uses, perhaps you guys are familiar with this. I know my sister absolutely loves natural cosmetics and um, oat is really wonderful to consider growing, especially if you have a larger garden and um, you want to utilize oat for, it has a bunch of different properties, but specifically for cosmetics, it's really great for face wash and things like that. And in your larger garden, it's an, a wonderful cover crop. Um, and along with that calendula, if you want to plant a little bit of happiness, look into planting calendula. And it's really great for, for topical purposes as well. Um, and I also want to mention, I'm not a doctor. None of us are doctors. We're farmers. So we just grow the herbs. Um, we can't prescribe them in any way. I'm just giving you guys ideas of things that you can do on your own. Um, but yeah, so facial steams, uh, shampoos, conditioners, herbal baths, and things like this are, are what you can use cosmetically. Um, culinary uses, this is probably what everyone's familiar with. Basil, rosemary, sage, using those in your turkey uh, sauces and things like this. Um, 
But what I want to do is challenge you guys to use herbs that perhaps you haven't used before and uh, start experimenting with fresh herbs. And that's one of the beautiful things about designing your own garden is that you can have um, that control as to, well, what herbs am I going to grow and, and, and using them on a daily basis um, to start figuring out, well, I like this one, don't like this one, etc. cetera. Um, and so a couple of ideas for culinary, uh, ways to incorporate herbs into your culinary dishes is infusing vinegars, which is a really fun one that we're going to be starting this year at Spirit Works. So if you're looking for infused vinegars, let us know. Um, you can make syrups as well. So elderberry makes a wonderful syrup and it has a bunch of really good things for your body um, and it's a good replacement to, to put on your, your pancakes in the morning. Uh, I can go on forever, but an oxymel, in case you guys don't know, is herbs infused with honey. So with that, <laughs> um, first aid as well. Uh, people for hundreds of thousands of years have been using herbs for, for um, medicinal purposes, first aid purposes. And here's a, a short list of a few herbs, um, especially in this area, mullein, plantain, that all grows around here. Um, and you can make poultices and antiseptics and things like this um, to help with, you know, cuts, bruises, bee stings, etc. So it's, it, it's um, perhaps you want to be designing a garden that's your, your home apothecary. Um, these would be some plants that you would consider um, growing. So like I said, not comprehensive list, but just to get the um, thoughts going. So we went over garden design, we went over just a couple herbs to start considering to grow. And now um, we want to put those two things together. So when we're looking into what herbs to grow into our gardens, we want to first look into whether they're perennial, annual, and etc. Um, and when you're planting your garden, you want to make sure you plant your perennials first. And then if there's any gaps, you put your annuals in those gaps. And then after that, you can just mulch for easy maintenance of your garden. Um, also height is very important when you're considering what's put where. So if you look at this picture, for example, you can see the really tall flowers in the back and then it goes to mid layer and then a shorter layer. Um, so if you plant something like echinacea right in front, it's gonna block everything else. Um, so just consider that in your boundaries of, of whatever design you choose. Um, companion planting, Todd had mentioned this earlier and companion planting is really great. So some plants love to be next to other plants. Some plants hate being next to other plants. So looking into graphs of what plants grow well together or don't grow well together is also important, especially with herbs. Um, growing conditions, right. So of course with anything you grow, you gotta make sure that they're happy where they are. So whether they want uh, wet soil, dry soil, nutrient dense soil, poor soil, etc., cetera, um, you wanna make sure that you're giving your plant that. And like Todd mentioned with the spiral gardens, that's a really great way if you're growing diverse herbs that have different requirements of moisture of the soil and things like that. You can plant the ones that really like the wet stuff at the bottom, the dry ones at the top, and so forth. Um, oh, also, of course, soil quality. Please look into the history of your soil or whatever you're planting in because if you're going to be ingesting the things you're growing, you wanna make sure that you're growing it in a very healthy environment. Um, so look into if there's been herbicide usage or pesticide usage on your property um, and things like that. And along with that is, of course, water quality. You don't want to be spraying chlorinated water on your plants, um, which I know is a big problem where I'm from originally. But yeah, so look into your water quality as well. Um, and lastly, we want to encourage the bees and the, and the butterflies. If you guys maybe want to design a garden, that's all about bringing the monarchs back. There are a ton of flowers you can plant, specifically the butterfly flower, um, that helps encourage that monarch population to come back. As well as being useful for your own purposes. Yeah, um, exactly. There are a lot of things you can do. Flowers have many medicinal purposes. So, um, so we went over a bit of how to incorporate uh, what herbs you're choosing into your design. So now, how do you harvest your herbs, right? Um, and also, when you, when you are planning out your gardens, Keep in mind what part of the plant you're going to be using because if you're harvesting let's say the root of a plant and you put it in a very beautiful pot and it's not easy to get out it, it, it's it's very difficult right or in a big d log bed and you have to get the fork in there so uh, just look into that um, and then try and plan that out accordingly 
And uh, so when we're harvesting our plants, there's a couple things we want to consider. So uh, first we want to look into the life, life, life cycle, life cycle of the plant, right? So as you can see by this picture here with the sunflower, um, we want to be harvesting our plants, especially medicinal herbs, at the correct time. Otherwise, sometimes it could cause bodily harm if you ingest that afterwards. Stinging nettle, for example. If you harvest that after it goes to flower, the silica content in the leaves is far too high. Um, and so you don't want to be ingesting that. So look into the herbs you're growing and when the optimal time to uh, harvest them is. Also, when harvesting, you want to consider the time of day. Um, whether it's in the morning or if the herb likes being picked in the day after the dew's dried off. Uh, calendula, you want to make sure the flower is fully open and has seen the sun before uh, harvesting that flower head. You also want to think about the time of season, of course. And you're not going to be harvesting strawberries now. That's, that's not going to work out. Um, also, oh yeah, I already mentioned parts of the plants, but something to consider. I mean, we're here at Free the Seeds. Right? So, so looking into harvesting your own seeds so that you can um, grow your own plants that you cultivate on your own land. And lastly, you've, you've harvested your plant, but, but now what to do with it? Um, so when you're out there and you're about to pick your herbs, you want to make sure that you're selecting clean material. So if your dog went out and just took a pee on the basil, maybe don't pick those plants. Um, but once you select that herb, you want to make sure that you're choosing the highest quality material possible. And um, by that, I mean if you have maybe a stalk this long with leaves on it, you want to take the shabby leaves at the bottom off and, and select the highest quality ones. Um, so once you have that herbal material, then you're going to use some kind of, if you're not going to use it fresh, um, then you want to preserve it for as long as you can. And to do that, you want to dehydrate it. And you can either dehydrate it by hang drying it in a very dry, um, well-ventilated, uh, cool area, dark area, to be cool. Um, and so hanging it up, if you have like a well-ventilated area in your kitchen that doesn't see much sunlight, is perfect. Otherwise, you can get a dehydrator um, from just about anywhere. And these are the temperatures we recommend dehydrating your herbs at. No higher than 110, because then it starts um, compromising the medicinal qualities of these herbs. And um, after you dehydrate your herbs, you can store them in glass jars, generally for about a year. I mean, you can keep them around for 10 years, but the, the, the taste and the medicinal qualities will start to diminish after approximately a year, depending on the herb. Um, You'll be able to tell if your herbs are going bad just by the smell. When you open up the jar, uh, if you have herbs that you haven't used in a while, go through your kitchen uh, pantry and be like, this has no smell, it smells like plastic. It's right. probably an older time to get some new ones. And when you are dehydrating them yourself, you want to make sure that they are fully dry before you put them in storage. Um, and make sure your containers are airtight as well. That's something people forget. Um, but yeah, make sure they're fully dry because otherwise they'll mold. Um, excuse me, Todd. Uh, I guess, well. I, I like just, about weeds. You, yeah. you like talking about Yeah. Okay. I love weeds. I just want to say don't use herbicides, but then go for it. <laughs> don't use herbicides. Why would you? Yeah. I don't know. That's my personal opinion. You could use whatever chemicals you want in your own garden. I don't. I'm not eating it anyway. Uh, uh, the there's a quote you probably had it on your yogi tea that says the difference between an herb and a weed is a perspective. And, and one of my favorite things about that is it's totally true. You see mullein and dandelion all over the place. Uh, dandelion is one of my favorite plants. Uh, it's one of the earliest pollinators around. The bees love it, and it's it's happening up. It's bringing up all those minerals from the deep in the soil. It's breaking up compaction. It's helping every other plant around it doing doing good stuff. Um, you, can make, you can use every single part of this from the flower, uh, the leaves, all the way down to the root. Good teas, makes wine. Uh, you can throw it in a salad. One of my favorite most versatile plants. And people are just spraying it to kill it just because they don't like it in their yard. Um, some weeds are a little more obnoxious, a little more literally noxious. Uh, your St. John's wort, a lot of farmers don't like it in this area just because it takes over. It does self-seed readily. Uh, things like dill, I would consider a weed if I wasn't growing them for, for cooking it. It's delicious, but it grows like a weed for sure. Uh, mullein's a little different. Uh, it kind of grows in those areas that are just taken apart and, and destroyed. It's helping your environment more than you can recognize. Uh, plants are great indicators of what's happening beneath the soil. So. Which uh, is a, a huge rabbit hole that we're, we're not, not going to fall into. But um, 
but yeah, feel free to look into that. We'll have some information on our website, I believe, uh, when the link I'll be showing you in just a moment. But uh, feel free to, to take a look at your, your weeds and, and get, get better at identifying them. When you're going out on a hike, you're going to love to be able to see what's around. Things like arnica, the wild berries, and that comes into the agroforestry and wild crafting. So. And, and the other note I had about, about herbicides as well is um, wherever you're planning to, to have your garden, consider what your neighbors are doing because if they're spraying or you know whatever whatever they're doing, you want to make sure that none of that is affecting your your herbs that you're growing. Especially like I said, if you're ingesting them, putting them on your body, you want to make sure you're growing the highest quality that you possibly can. Um, which brings us to our farm. So if you guys ever want to come by, we would absolutely love you to. Every Wednesday from two to seven, we have open farm hours. So you're welcome to come on by, check out our apothecary. Um, we have a bunch of herbal products that we make as well, like medicinal jams and honeys um, and things like this. And also, occasionally there'll be some eggs there, which we have uh, a very large flock and we'll be selling the pullets of shortly here and also in a couple months from now. So if you're looking for some chickens, let us know. Um, and when the weather gets a bit nicer during Wednesdays, we're also going to have farm tours. So we would love to show you guys the mandala that we have on the property and um, the different herbs that we're, we're growing there. Uh, let's see, what else? Oh, um, and if you want to try our eggs, please go to Uptown Hearth. They have uh, really wonderful breakfasts that they make there and they use our eggs for those. Um, and also Third Street Market, we sell some of our eggs there. Um, and uh, the resources I promised you are at this website on this link. So spiritworksherbs.com uh, re uh, slash resources. And there I put, um, I just kind of quickly made a, a graph to show you guys like the different herbs and uh, whether they can be used for cosmetics, wellness, and so forth. And then a, a bit of a mental picture, so whether they make you sleepy or what have you. Um, but again, uh, on, on that resource page, I also included books that I referenced because this isn't my knowledge, this is other people's knowledge that I'm relaying to you. So I would highly recommend if you're interested in learning more about herbs to look at those resources as well as, I think there's a book, uh, one book about garden design. And um, if you come to the farm and you have more questions and want to know more things, we'll be there for you. So let us know. Yeah. We also sell our herbs too. So. Um, aside, if you're looking for your garden plants and you need to be able to put them in, you can come to us for those, not just eggs, but yeah. And I also wanted to share one other thing. Um, learning about herbs and how to use them is huge. It's, it's a vast and deep field. There's um, contraindications, but many, many, many benefits. It has been a huge learning curve for me. And my son, who's the clinical herbalist and naturopathic physician, is going to be regularly coming to Montana to um, help help us with our knowledge, but also will be available for consultations. And he's going to be doing workshops that will be um, 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 publicizing through our website. So if you go to spiritworkshop.com, <coughs> there's a way to subscribe to the website where you'll hear about different events and workshops that we have happening. We scheduled one just today. Um, if you go into the, um, the big event room, the, first, the second booth on the right, you'll, you'll see a tower garden um, that's some very innovative in-house in technology for growing plants and herbs. Um, they're going to be coming to the farm on March 13th during our apothecary hours to be available to, you know, really to talk to people in, in greater depth about utilizing that application. Um, and Patty, who was one of the presenters here today, did a, a regenerative soil workshop yesterday. She's going to be coming back this summer to do more of that. Um, we're totally committed to sharing our learning and um, resources with people who come to the farm and we're having a whole lot of fun doing it so we hope that you'll you know tap into it and join us it's the best game we found mm -hmm. are, are there any questions i was wondering did you just like pick an herb and like take us through its life cycle for a year like what you would do for that like one herb 
Oh, how about air. this? Okay. Are you fertilizing them? We, right. Like so, so there's a whole lot of time left still. And what I was hoping to encourage everyone to do is, as you're thinking about your dream gardens and designs, uh, we put up all of these lovely herbs. Well, go ahead. That's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Um, we put up all of these herb sheets. And so you can go around and, and read the different herbs. And so if you want to select one that you think is interesting. So is this like the life cycle of an herb up there? So no, no, this is, uh, this is just a few okay. varieties of herbs I, that I, we I'm grow gonna, on. I'm going to address that question. Okay. <laughs> um, so the, the first thing is obviously starting with a seed. And so before you even start with a seed, you want to know where the seed came from whether or not it's um, if the medicinal herb, you want it to be a certified organic seed. You um, preferably, um, in this climate, you want some, a seed that has come from a similar climate. So uh, seed companies like Johnny Herbs, um, Johnny Selected Seeds, um, Fedco Seeds, um, Good Seed Company um, are all um, the, the seeds have been produced in a similar climate so that they tend to have a hardiness to it. So that's the number one thing. Um, number two is you want to uh, research what the seed germination requirements are. Something like echinacea needs, needs to have frozen. It, it needs, the seed needs to have been frozen in order to germinate. So for a minimum of two weeks. We left a whole bunch of seeds um, in the seed room. You could take a couple of seed heads home and you'll, you'll, uh, we're, we're all about everybody growing echinacea. One of the things about echinacea, then you want to know what are the soil light requirements of it. I naively, knowing how valuable echinacea was, I put it in my best soil in the garden. It was a loose, sandy loam that had a lot of soil nutrients in it. And Two years later, I, I learned that echinacea, because it's an, an adaptogen, um, prefers um, really gnarly soil um, that it has to work really hard to get into. That's what builds the adaptogenic medicinal qualities of, of that herb. So you want to learn what, what kind of, um, what the characteristics of the herb are in, in respect to um, um, the, the potency of the earth for, for its soil, light, and, and um, um, so do you have moisture a requirements. For a book or something? Like, I feel like if I'm on, a, an, on my catalog, they just like give you like fluffy information, mm -hmm. like not any real good mm -hmm. information. Do you have like a, I'm, it's probably on your website. But. Um, right now, um, mm -hmm. I think we're becoming the best books that we have. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and we have an extensive library. If this is something that you want to come and personally research for yourself, I would welcome you to come and spend um, you know, an afternoon. And I'll orient you to the books that I've used that, and I'm constantly using. But um, on, the, um, on the resource um, page that is, um, first of all, this whole presentation, all of those slides you saw, are on our website. At the bottom uh, on, the, uh, on the page that says slash resources, at the end of that um, are a list of some of the books um, that we find most valuable. Rico Check, um, who founded a company called Strictly Medicinals, it used to be called Horizon Herbs, um, has written a lot of uh, a book, I think it's called The Medicinal Herb Grower, and he has actually written three or four books. One of them is on the um, um, the hardest to grow herbs and the ones that are, are becoming extinct that are on the endangered species list. Um, and he goes extensively into um, the planting and growth requirements. Um, uh, the carpenters, what's the name of their book? Um, oh, the farm, I see the, I see his yeah, face. Yeah, um, the, I think the this organic. is called the medicinal herb grower. I think that's the name of his book. The yes. guy's name is Carpenter. He um, married Rosemary Gladstar's daughter. They farm in Vermont. And um, he has um, extensive knowledge um, in, in, in his book of not just about the growing of the herbs, but also the drying and, and marketing of them. 
Um, uh, the, the, some of the most key things about the life cycle of the herbs that I have found in most challenging to constantly be trying to, um, um, it's, it's the octopus that I wrestle with, and these two are joining me in that game, is, you know, when is the optimum time to harvest? And um, Megan mentioned you, you, most aerial plants you want to harvest between 10 and 2. And what you're looking at at the, um, at the um, either end of the spectrum is that at the 10 o'clock time is really when is it that the dew has, has um, come off of the plant. The 2 o'clock time has, what the plant is doing is it's got the dew on it and then it, the dew comes off and it starts to perk up and the sun is pulling all of the energy up out of the roots into the potency of the leaves. And it's kind of going, yippee, I'm ready. And then the sun hits and hits and hits and it goes, oh, you miss me. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to try to catch it before it's had too much sun and um, is starting to wilt. It will come back the next day and go through that same thing, unless it's something like a calendula flower that it will maybe do that two or three times and then it, it'll, it'll uh, go to seed and set out new flowers. Um, it'll, it'll pump out new flowers. You'll want to know things like your calendula plants will just keep pumping out all, all season long for you once they start blooming. Um, however, if you're not picking the flowers, which is the part you want to use, um, the flowers will go to seed and all the energy of the plant will go into seed production, not flower production. So you want to be going around and regularly deadheading your calendula plant so that you will get the most flowers until the end of the season when you want them to go to seed so you'll have the seeds to plant next year. Um, in terms of root? Yeah. You can leave the flower head on the stalk and pick the, pick the, the, the flower head um, this time of year. Um, before the spring rains hit, and um, and, it, and it's done its freeze cycle for you, and you don't have to harvest it, put it into the um, freezer. The root plants, um, when you're wanting to harvest roots, you you want to wait until the plant's done now, all its photosynthesis and it's, it, and it's died back, and then the energy's gone down into the root, and um, and so you're digging them. In fall, sometimes early spring. Um, the only, the only um, major exception for that for us is our dandelions, which we harvest all the time. And I find that um, it's really on the moist days when the, um, uh, it can be, and the ground is saturated, that it can be most su successful getting a good fleshy uh, root up and get the whole root. Um, which, you know, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. We, we, we bless our dandelions, they really aren't a problem. And, um, oh, did we miss something in terms of life cycle? Um, uh, we didn't really talk. I want to mention that if you are harvesting poor root, um, check on the, the optimal time to harvest the root. Sometimes the plant has to go through two years of its life cycle, sometimes even three, before it's at its, uh, the point where you're going to want to harvest it. Yeah. Like Ella campaign, um, I was think I was I'm new to this, I'm, but I have a, a nice crop of Ella campaign that are now my grandmother's because I waited too long. Uh, Ella campaign, you want to harvest them in their second year, maybe their third, but I was going for fourth fourth year, knowing that that's better for echinacea. So uh, you know, they both be given to me. Who cares? But. You know, you do have to differentiate, <laughs> um, and the echinacea does want you to wait uh, till the fusion of the um, So that's time of life. Um, and then maybe tucking them in for winter? Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 um, we're primarily going into a complete no-till. Um, most of your herbs are perennials. Um, it's really nice not to have to work too hard with, with weeding, but uh, from a, a much more important point of view, um, any
pulling up of root plant roots or tilling or cultivating around a plant um, is disturbing the microbiome in the in the soil. And you really, it, it is becoming increasingly aware to me of how important it is not to disturb the soil and the the whole ecology that's happening with the deep below the ground. Um, when you harvest a plant, um, don't pull it up unless you are harvesting the roots. Cut it off at the ground, mulch it for the next season, um, and if it's an annual, let the roots decay in the ground. They become a channel for minerals, for water, for worms to start to uh, create the mineral and moisture exchange to greater and greater depths and, and support the growth of the microbes. So you would turn the tops of your annuals and leave the yeah. roots down there? Yeah, leave them there. Or you can just leave the whole thing if you don't mind the ugliness, but if you don't like the ugliness, then just yeah. chop it down. Yeah, and if, it, and if you're going to deadhead it, you can, and, and the plant's not diseased, just deadhead it, mulch it, uh, use the plant to mulch itself. And if you don't like the way it looks, use the plant to mulch itself and then put a pretty mulch on top. <laughs> um, we, we have created, actually one of my interns from several years ago um, got college credit for her time with me. And she created these monoliths that are um, the signs that we have on our farm so that people can do self-directed guided tours. And it, it talks, um, it identifies different things that are, are interesting in planning. Feel free to come look at them. So feel free yeah, to come on the website. No. Those are not on the website. Um, and Can we take I, pictures of the ones you may take. Have? You may take pictures of the ones that are of interest to you. And um, I'll get permission from Lily to see if I can put them on the website. But um, I mean, because. She hasn't referenced all of her sources for that. Um, we didn't feel comfortable doing that. But there's, um, in, in the books on the resource pages, there's a ton of books that do just this, um, and, and then some, you know, like the Rico, Rico talks about growing conditions as well as the usages. But yeah, thank you. Any other questions? We hope you'll come visit our farm. Um, it, um, it's becoming a, a very magical, special place, and um, and I'm, I'm by background I'm a healing arts practitioner. The intention for my property is that it be a healing sanctuary for those who come there, and um, we hope you guys create your own with your own gardens. Did anyone do any drawing? Any drawing? No. Oh man, I was hoping for some beautiful. <laughs> and if you're, and if you're having, oh, if you're having a fish. Yeah. yeah. And if you're, if, you, if you're where in Whitefish, we're uh, north on 93. Yeah. yeah. And if you're having a challenge with your garden design, come to us on a Wednesday and pick our brains. That's what you know. That's what we've made ourselves available for.